Hello, and welcome to The Goddess in Art. Our program today is about food and nurturing, about transformation in art. My name is Star Goody, and my guest today is performance artist Barbara T. Smith. Barbara's been doing performance work for over 20 years. Welcome, Barbara. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Barbara, I know that you're currently in the middle of a, a work in progress, and it's six performance dinners called La Comedia del Art. And yeah. I noticed you call that a food art series. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, I've um, been working in uh, performance for a long time, and the uh, I notice and I am, have the interest in food in those pieces. I've been doing these pieces for um, off and on throughout my um, career, and I've always had the desire to have a, uh, a, a series of pieces that were entirely focused on food and different artists who have used food in their work. So um, now that I have a home in Venice that I have just recently a acquired, I decided this is the perfect place for it. And so um, we began it um, two months ago uh, with a piece by Richard Newton, and then I just did a piece myself. Right, and that was the cauldron, uh -huh. the ting. Yeah, I know right. you, you threw the I Ching for that, didn't yeah, you? <laughs> as, well, actually, it was about the whole series because I was very, uh, it, it's a big venture, and I was uh, curious whether or not I felt I should do it, and I used the I Ching as a uh, kind of um, mirror for my um, questions in life. And uh, so I threw the I Ching three different times, three different separate days, and every time it came up to the cauldron, which talks about nurturing people and the healing aspects of uh, ceremony and uh, uh, ritual and food for people. So I thought, better do it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> well, like you said, you've used food a lot in your work, and one mm -hmm. of the intriguing things to me about your work is that sense of food and nurturing, that sense of transformation of what mm -hmm. food is. Mm -hmm. um, and how it is sort of an alchemical thing of you're mixing things and mm -hmm. something new is taking place and some transformation through the fire of, of life, really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I know that, again, this isn't the first time you've used food. I mean, you have a whole different series of pieces that you mm -hmm. have done. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I guess the first one was in uh, 1969. First food piece. It, uh, I started doing pieces sooner, but um, it was at Stanley and Lelise Grinstein's house, and it was a monumental undertaking. <laughs> and there really are um, huge pieces when when they are um, like for a, a number of guests. The, the guests, in that sense, were the performers actually, and and the um, whole piece in that case was a a, a um, sort of a cosmic interaction between the body and uh, the universe. And it was uh, like um, coming into a mystical surgery in which the people were put into surgical clothes and sat at a table where the food was all served in surgical equipment. And it oh. was like a, um, a, a profound um, Mass. It was a, a, an incredible experience to do it and to be part of it. M you know, you don't even realize what the meaning of all this is until you start to actually do it, and that's when it really is amazing. <laughs> well, yeah. that hits upon something for me that I think is very interesting in, in your work in performance art, that it isn't just theater and the audience is back, like, applauding you, but there's a boundary that's sort of dropped between, like, you know, the audience and you, and yeah. that they are really part of the piece, and, and that sense of what you're saying is you don't really know what's going to happen, and that's that, that sense of transformation. Yeah. And for something really to happen, you have to leave some sort of open space. Exactly, yeah. What I try to do is set up a, a um, circumstance in which there's a lot of intense pressure put on me, in particular, and on the uh, performance moment or the ceremonial moment. And uh, a whole lot of um, different um, intentions are brought to bear. But at the moment of the piece, there's an open space in which it's like going to the source of things where you have no idea what's going to happen. It's like making love. And in that moment, um, the intensity of your involvement um, releases energy. And the people in the piece who are there, um, because they're not separated from it by an artificial barrier that creates a stage setting, um, they don't get to sit back and, and look at the thing as some separate thing from them. They have to always have the sense that it's happening right around them and they're actually even part of it. 
And so it forces them to realize their own experience in the piece. If it works, and if they're really able to accept what's happening, then um, the, um, the thing can actually be a very meaningful and, and moving experience for them as well. It has to be for me, because I'm the carrier of the meaning of the piece. I'm like a vehicle of it. And I think of it that way. I think of myself as, a, as a putting my, making myself available for this kind of work, almost like a, a, a tube or something, you know, through which the piece flows. Well, I was thinking, you know, available for you don't know what, really. Right. Yeah. <laughs> because if, some, if there isn't some magic that comes through for you, if you aren't transformed, then anything Yeah, really and when happens. you get in some of these things, you know, you're saying to you, I mean, I'm like everybody else, I'm there, and I'm thinking, what have you set up for yourself? <laughs> I'm in the piece, and I'm either aware of, of the other people, the, the guests, who are very close to me. I know them very often, and I, in this most recent piece, you know, I'm walking around seeing friends of mine, or in other cases when there's a, a, a very big attempt is being made in the piece to, to reach a very deep and, and well, I don't know, um, beyond my personal self space. When I get in the piece, I'm saying to myself, okay, you've set this thing up for yourself, and there's no other time. You can't escape it. I mean, you either do it now or you don't. So by God, you better do it, you know, and I just go for it. But it, there's been times when you think, can I do this? And, and only by just giving into it does, it does it happen at best, you know. There's some pieces that aren't as good as others, obviously. You know. Well, that's that risk and the chance you take. And, yeah. and, and it occurs to me, too, that it isn't always necessarily so pleasant. I mean, it's not a Barishnikov on point, you know, dancing or, you know, in some, yeah. like, total beauty or something. But, I mean, of course, not that your pieces don't have their beauty, but that mm -hmm. there's certainly can be, like, an unpleasantness to go through or, you yeah. know, if, if something's moving through and you don't know what's going to be happening. Yes. I've had two things in that regard. One is the actual process of putting the piece together. Since my work is transformational and since it involves my own development, as an artist and human and a spiritual being, and it involves my sense of my own sense of spiritual source separate from what I've been conditioned and yet still learning from other teachings. When I am going into a piece, uh, especially a major piece like this recent one was, um, I'm called to learn something and, and it's usually got an element of uh, pain or um, you know, something I have to give up. Mm. You know, something that I, an idea or part of my being, or and sometimes they're very, very difficult. And like in this piece, for example, it was very hard for me to understand what I was naming the piece because it changed, not the cauldron name, that was the overall title, but the interactions with the people in the piece, for example. At first I, it was about me and younger women, so it was like mother-daughter, mm -hmm. teacher-student, uh, you know, and all that. But then two of the women uh, uh, couldn't do it. So then the women were all, two of them were more my age, so it changed entirely. It became like a spiral in time or something. But I never could name it. And the emotional roller coaster you go through while you're arriving at the piece is part of the process, and it involves a terrific amount of faith. And on the other hand, sometimes pieces have tapped into very dark spaces. Mm. and. Uh, you know, not always, not always um, elevated high places, but very, very dark and deep places, and beautiful at the same time because of their incredible power, and and because of their necessity of coming through, and because that's what I guess so. You know, I mean, that's the kind of work I found myself in. It's <laughs> like I didn't, as an art student, you know, I didn't go out and say, "This is what I'm going to do." I was a painter and a sculptor, and and so forth, and. And around 1960, when I, I had a very big transformational experience, and, and my vision literally changed, and my hearing changed, and mm. everything, which included just a flood of art ideas coming into my head. And some of them I couldn't peg into ordinary categories, and they involved doing actions, and I had these strange ideas of doing things. And it took until 68 for me to understand at all what it was and to start doing it. And that's what became the focus of my work is as my, myself as the being that carries the art and 
and uh, the process. And that's what it's been ever since, <laughs> more or less. You know, I do other things too. Well, that's an interesting thing again, you know, what you're saying, this shift of your awareness and your perception because from what I, the sense that I get of your work is that the real key of the transformational element is the genuineness or the aliveness that it's, you know, it's not something again that's a part that's set off, but that there has, there is that quality of spontaneity and, and the th what really works is if it's really real and I know that that's what you're really interested mm, in, it's like a genuine definitely. effect and, and, and again you have to be transformed. Yeah. And I, 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 even you know, out of this process and the, the, the awareness that it is a spiritual uh, thing, uh, I have, and out of my own need in different ways, I've, I've studied with different spiritual uh, teachers. And, you know, I'm very indebted to those teachings. And they're not in one path only, you know. But um, that has um, also enriched the work and it's the, the difficulty and the odd thing about it is that um, you know I understand like more about how when you go through a difficult um, journey say if you sit in a Zen session for say five days it's very difficult and it's also very demanding and your mind says what am I doing this for you know <laughs> And then the question you ask yourself yeah, all the time, like that joke about performance art. Well, anyway, and uh, so, but once you get on the other side, you've had an an irrevocable change. It's cumulative, and there's a change. Same thing with the American Indian work I'm doing now. Going through the ceremonies that are part of that path, it wouldn't seem like going out and sitting on a mountain all night would do. I mean, we could do it on a camping trip, and that does change people as well, and in the spiritual way. But doing it with the intentions involved, with that teaching, you come away different, and and they call them gateways, and that it really is, and and that's what I find amazing. And I think the art process is the same, and I don't think just performance, but I happen to be doing that, you know. So that's one way. Yeah, and that that sense for me is is that there's a lot. You're willing to not know. You're willing to be in that space of not knowing, and like what you said about <laughs> a lot of not knowing, <laughs> yeah. and uh, to, to be letting go. Of but that's control. the adventure too. Yeah, right. I that's mean, I would much rather do that than things that are all prescribed. You know, it's a, uh, it's 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 it creates a path. It calls you to the place that is unknown. That's what the calling is. And two, I noticed in this uh, piece you called it, or you described yourself as art life. And again, mm. you said how there isn't um, the the performer and the audience. That you just, it's almost like a mode of being to just carry. Yeah, through. that's what I was going to say. It's it's not uh, it, at different times in the mainstream art dialogue. This kind of thing has been um, part of the dialogue and interesting. At times, it's it it falls way out of that because it doesn't. Um, my dialogue is not with other arts so much as it is with my internal um, growth and, and my whole life involvement. And I really am interested in that integration of all of our aspect, all of our parts of life into a sense of wholeness, um, which is something I think we desperately need in our culture. Yeah, and it gives more tribal really sensibility. Yeah, you know, and it's certainly a different aesthetic of what the yeah. art is for you. It's more of a transformation. But I'd like to start looking at some of these oh, pieces. Right. I know the first piece we're going to be looking at is um, A Long Day's Night. The Longest Day of Night. The Longest yes, Day of right. Night. And, you know, so our <coughs> viewers can see some of these wonderful pieces that you're doing. So if we could uh, have the first image up here. And, Barbara, maybe you could explain to us. Yeah, well, this was a piece I did in um, 1974, I think it was when the comet Cahotec was uh, coming to Earth and had been, I think, recently discovered, it was on its a very long journey, you know. Uh, maybe we won't see it in human lifetime again. I really don't know its periodicity, but... And um, I had this wonderful uh, studio where there was a very long hallway that you can see in the slide, and there Let's was... Let's see this next slide. I know we have... Um, and uh, there was a, a very a huge skylight over the mm -hmm. whole area. So we made a long table down the center, and the entire piece was involved with light and dark, you know, mm -hmm. and like a cosmic space and cosmic orientation. And the people were asked to come at midnight, and they wore all black or silver clothes. And uh, the, those lights that you see in the slide are 
airplane landing lights. They were very okay. intense lights that, that um, hit off of another set which f formed um, a, um, oh, what's the word? Anyway, they, they, the, the one light triggered the other light. And then there was high intensity bulbs down the center of the space that could go up and down. We had a Tesla coil which was making light phenomenon with neon tubes and, and uh, awesome music. We, we, that's another part of these pieces that takes, a, you know, I had to make about a four hour score of sound to go through the meal. And then all of the food was black and uh, silvery and uh, there was a uh, shadow um, pieces that happened in the skylight above and there were uh, dance between a spin that made one answer a black being in front and a, and a shadow being behind, all this stuff. <coughs> and it was, um, it went on and on and on. It's a six course meal and uh, I think the first course was caviar and uh, it went to black bean soup and, uh, oh. <laughs> and there was, uh, um, let's see, we had uh, fresh oysters and uh, that, that um, clear noodles and so forth. Yeah. And anyway, at the very end, finally, uh, the, the people, uh, there were white doves released in the space. And then oh. everyone got in cars and drove to the top of Mount Wilson. And it was like being in a great Russian novel. The wind was whipping. <laughs> it was the snow on the ground. People had these long dresses. And we stood there. We, and I was utterly exhausted. I hadn't slept for two nights. The and pressure we, you put yourself on. Right. Right. <laughs> oh. And we watched the sunrise in this awesome, you know, these great mm. antennas from the, the television, uh, and all the major antennas are up there, plus the observatory. It was like being in outer space. But it was uh, a very moving uh, journey that, that took a long time. And the people sat there, and it's very scary sometimes for the audience because they don't want the participants, they don't know what's expected of them. Yeah, they so, don't know either. No, yeah. and I'm guiding them through sort of an illumination experience where they can come and witness, hopefully, this this visitor that's come from so far to visit us, you know. And it's really, uh, it was wonderful. Let's see some more of the uh, slides on this because I know we have some food images here. And again, it is food art because yeah. it really is art the way you yeah. you you put this together and yeah. The well, just like it. having all the food be black and then and and that uh, that the act of eating with these other people is you know ceremonially in in, in tribal cultures, uh, food preparation and food consumption is a sacred act. Mm. And and in a ceremony, it's high ceremony. I mean, it's high. Uh, they go to altered states, and I think that's what happens in these pieces. I I guide the people into another level of consciousness, and on that level, you're accessible to new information beyond the ordinary causal cause and effect interaction that's in the material world. At least that's my belief, and that's my experience. Yes, and it's more, again, it's more than theater, and it, it, it is ceremony, you know, yeah. and that there is a quality of yeah. aliveness. And uh, um, let's see the rest of the slides on this one, because I know you have kind of a, a behind-the-scenes slide, too, that yeah. lets us know that it is, it is oh, a really high it's ceremony, it's but it's mayhem. also high work it, at times. Here's the people. Now, let's see the next piece here. Then we see the people enjoying the dinner here, and, uh -huh. and in, the, in the ceremony here. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it ended about 4 in the morning and uh -huh. so forth. And uh, the, they're eating um, my, uh, the um, yeah. There's the slide. They're eating um, this oysters. Is the worst part here, right? <laughs> well, you know, preparing the food, we get a lot of it ready ahead of time, and somehow I had neglected to un to think about how you open fresh oysters. <laughs> we got all these fresh oysters arrived, and I thought, oh my God, we've got to open these, and their people are arriving. You know, I. So that's part of a transformation. You don't know oh. what's going to happen. And not only that, there, the, you know, there's a special knife that you have to use. And fortunately, the friend of mine, who is a restaurant owner and also an artist, Artisan Phillips, had arranged for this food. And he came to the piece, and he also happened to have some oyster knives in his car. <laughs> and he comes backstage, sta so to speak, and he sat there and. Uh, I mean, and we gathered everything we could, and they start opening things. Well, it makes a terrific noise because you have to pound them on. And I thought everyone's out there hearing this pounding sound rather than the. But it. What no does Barbara really. T. Smith have in store for us tonight? <laughs> but it didn't actually uh, affect it at all, and they 
you know, they just worked very fast and got them done. So you have to be grounded in all worlds. Oh, yeah. Know. And and it's like cueing a, um, a musical comedy or something. You have, you know, mm. in that case, I wasn't in the piece. I'm just cueing this, and it's entirely a meal, which is a guided food experience for those people. That's not always the case, but in this, that piece Yeah, I know the, the next piece that we wanted to look at, it was a very different thing. I mean, you just really shifted it and, and uh, mm -hmm. had a whole, this is, the next piece was just you by yourself, right? right. Well, I had, I had recently um, had done a piece up in San Francisco, which was also about food, but it, it, it was called Feed Me, and it mm -hmm. involved my interaction with other people very intensely, one-to-one, -one, mm -hmm. for a long period of time. And it was so intense that my body wanted to balance from that piece. And this is frequently what happens. And I, the next piece that comes to my mind is something that is completely different. And in, in, in the case of that, that thing, I was uh, out in the field for eight hours by myself. I didn't move from that spot. And it was like an extended meditation. I called it pure food. And I was being fed then by nature, the vibrations from nature, and the um, 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 cosmic rays, sun, and the, uh, you know, the rays that are immaterial. And that was, I was, and I was by myself. So it was like a balance from the form of peace. But I called it pure food, and I felt like I was being fed. Right, so yeah. it was more, it's like this plant, it was more direct, you yeah. know, rather than just consuming something, it was just yeah. coming right upon Yeah, it you. wasn't through the vehicle of other people and other objects. It was, yeah, directly coming to me. I wanted to get to your, uh, the current piece that you just did. Mm -hmm. I know that that, um, it, we're in the autumn now, and it really has a lot to do with, had a lot of autumn energy in it, yeah. and harvest, a sense of harvest about it. And it, you introduced <coughs> something, the squash, and I know you had oh, yeah. earlier practice on the squash, right. which we to look at. Yeah. Uh, a well, this, that's a like kind of, our squash, right? Yeah. <laughs> that was from a, uh, when I went back to graduate school in 1970, and I had left the marriage, and I, so I had a dinner where I invited um, both my new art friends and my former friends together. And I served, part of the dinner was served, uh, was a huge Hubbard squash that I got. And I had made the, I took the meat out and made some, a, a dish with pineapple and so forth. And I served it in the shell of the squash. The whole meal was such a beautiful bridge between these two groups of friends and you know, everything that I really felt wonderful about it. Not only that, this the shell of the squash was so beautiful I couldn't throw it away. So I brought it back to the studio. And then I kept thinking about it and I thought, that's a holy squash. Mm. And and that squash is sacred. And that squash, I'm going to start a religion about this <laughs> sacred squash. And then I started talking about it. I had some people working for me in my studio on another thing I was doing. And I, and I was joking. And one day I made all these little weird things in a line and I put them inside the squash. And I said, you guys got to come down and look because I'm going to seal the squash up. And you're going to be the only people who know what is inside it. So you're the, mm. like the cardinals of my religion. <laughs> and so I began to create a hierarchy, hierarchy. So two of them looked at the things and one stayed up in his ladder, didn't want to get down. Anyway, we precast mm -hmm. the sculpture and eventually took it into the gallery at Irvine. And through a week of time, day by day, I, um, went through the process of first creating a mold for the um, squash so that it could be suspended in the middle and I would cast the um, thing in resin, which is what that slide was about. Okay. And now it exists. It's about a 150-pound object. <laughs> and, and, and then we had um, mass. We cooked squash all the time and so forth, and it went on and on. And finally, it became a, what I consider a bona fide religion. It had miracles. We were persecuted at all the things. <laughs> and it was kind of funny. Now, in this time, here comes the squash back into my work. And it's like a, a real living squash, which we, uh, c we cooked in a fire pit in clay. And then uh, it was like the uh, action of the feminine. It is a very feminine in image. And uh, like the womb of the earth is the creator of, of life. And we served it as a um, as a as a meal to you know a symbolic meal to the people there. But we also had um, the rays of light that were caught by mylar, mirrorized mylar that were dashing around the yard, and that was sort of to represent the action of the masculine. 
the sun energy, and and we had dried fruit there. So then the squash and the dried fruit was mixed together in the thing, the cauldron, and then uh, as it integrating, making a clear channel of masculine and feminine energy, and going back to source, and then feeding the people both together, and so it became an integrated spiritual experience in using my secrets <laughs> my religion. And it was, and, and further, you know, in the piece I was doing, uh, I, I had these women who represented the four directions, and we, um, I began with a circling of the, of the, uh, of the uh, fire pit in, uh, as if I was circling through time, and we had an audio tape that went through long time, a sound from the all time. And then eventually I uh, began to chant, and I began to find this incredible inner voice that's developing in me. It's an incredible sound that's coming out of me, and I don't quite know where it's going. That's the me, and the, that's what the piece was. Well. I think one of the most wonderful things about your work is that integration of the opposites of, you know, wanting to blend all these things and getting back to like the source that yes. we all come from, mm -hmm. and also, you know, the transformation of what's happening with you and, you know, yeah. that something so unique is coming through for you and and mm -hmm. where it's all going to oh, lead. We we really don't know. Uh, <laughs> so um, yeah, I I believe that it's wonderful, and it's getting more and more uh, free. And joyous because as I at attend to the um, inner difficult things in, in the pieces, they've suddenly gone away. It's like released energy, and it's more to do more for other people, I think. Well, I know that you'll always be finding things to do, Barbara, and I want to thank you so much for being my oh, guest tonight. It's my pleasure. <laughs> I very much appreciate it. <laughs> okay, you're welcome. Good night. Thank you.